In Berea, they received the word of God with eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. I feel like a politician or something out there. Vote for me! Vote for me! We will vote I wash my hands of this. Okay, we are in Berea, and Berea, I tell you, there were six or seven buses on our ship. There were evangelical Protestant groups. They didn't go to Thessalonica, uh, Thessaloniki. They all came here. I know why. Because of what the book of Acts says here. Have you ever heard of a church called the Berean Bible Church? Yes. No. There's all over the country. If you look up Berean Bible Church or Berean Baptist Church, there's thousands of them across the country because of what Paul did here and how Luke <coughs> recorded it. So what I want to do to start out is to read that passage. But for, first, I, I want to explain the pictures. It starts over here on the left. This is in Troas, in Turkey of today. It was on the water of Turkey uh, at, across the sea from Greece. And Paul was intending to go around what was then Turkey, Asia Minor at the time, but Turkey now. And, but he said that the angel of the, he was stopped. For God wouldn't let him go. He stopped him from going around there. And then in the middle of the night in Troas, he had a vision. Before he had this vision, I'll tell you a funny story. It said that he had traveled all day with his fellow workers. And they came to Troas, and they got there in the evening. They all went up to the third floor. This is Acts chapter 20, by the way. They all went up on the third floor. And there was, it says there's candles burning for the lights. And he preached all night long <laughs> after traveling all day. And around midnight, it says that a young man named Eutychus, because of the warm candles, he's sitting on the third floor, like up there, and he fell asleep and tumbled out of the window and fell dead on the ground below. <laughs> Paul went down. It doesn't say he was dead, but it implies it. Paul went down and he fell on the man and prayed for him. The guy got up. Paul went back up and he preached the rest of the night. <laughs> and in the morning, they all left to go another day's journey. How many of you could have kept up with St. Paul? <laughs> this, is, this guy was indefatigable. He just he was driven to tell people about Jesus Christ. So now he's in Troas on the shoreline of, of eastern Turkey, western Turkey, and the angel, a man from Macedonia, comes to him in a vision and says, "Please come to Macedonia and help us." So Paul got up in the morning, and then they boarded a ship and they went across to Greece and they landed in Philippi, where we're going tomorrow. We're going to be landing in Neapolis. That's where Paul landed, in Neapolis. And he talked to them there. Then he went into Philippi. We're going to walk on the Ignatian Road tomorrow, which is part of the old Roman road that Paul walked on. It was hundreds of miles long. The Romans built 250,000 miles of main roads. These were like 8 feet or 10 feet wide. They dug, they dug foundations 4 feet deep to build sand and rock so that these roads would last forever. And you'll see wherever they still exist, they're still there. And they made that so their armies could march eight men abreast down those roads all through the empire. We're gonna walk on one tomorrow between Neapolis and Philippi. And Janet and I discovered it when we were making our movie on St. Paul. By the way, if you don't have it, you'll see all these places if you watch it, we're on location. We are filming here. And we went back said it's got to be somewhere here and we went back in this woods bush and i found the road the old road but you could only see a little of it and every time we brought this cruise we'd stop there's no place to stop it's on that big road and the bus drivers always get mad at me but i always say we have to stop here and we get off and we go through the bushes and over a hill and everybody walked on the road of saint paul the road the ignatian way we'll do that tomorrow but now somebody else discovered it and they cleared it all out so now other people are stopping theirs too i should get a commission but you'll walk tomorrow on that road that paul walked on from neapolis there when we're done here there's some stones from the old Roman road along the way. They're on the side of the road. 
And so when we're done here, those who want to get on the buses can, but those who want maybe about a four minute walk up the road where they are, I'll show you and you can touch. This is the road St. Paul walked on. This is our, our tour pilgrimage is the footprints of Paul. So you, I'm, I'm showing you these places along the way so you can know all these places he walked. And anyway, he left Thessalonica. What happened there is he three, sa three Sabbaths, that's Saturdays, he, ar he argued, it says, <laughs> You know, people think, well, we're, Christ we're Catholics and Christians. We shouldn't argue. But he argued with them all through the Sabbath, arguing about the scriptures, proving that the Savior must, that the Christ must die and raise again. And they abused him. They dis 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 uh, had discern scorn for him. And they basically chased him out of the city. Some people believe, but they chased him out of the city and like we usually fled for his life. He left there and he came here. And when he came here, it says that he came and spoke to the Bereans and did the same with them. He presented from the scriptures about the fact that Jesus had to die and raise from the dead. And the Messiah that you're waiting for is him. And the Jews always hated it when he did that because they, they said that they were jealous because a whole bunch of Gentiles believe those uncircumcised goyim dogs. <laughs> Jews can't even eat with you. They can't have any kind of uh, social gatherings with you. They can't come into your house say, because you're unclean. One time I got in a debate at the Western Wall with a Jewish, one of the Hasidic guys with the curly hair, and I was filming, and I mentioned at the Western Wall that Jesus loved the temple that stood there, and these guys went ballistic, and they came up and said, you can't say that name here. And we got into a big argument, and the only way, I, and by, police were called, rabbis were called. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh it, was, it was, I realized at the moment that if I was back in the days of the early church, just like St. Stephen, my name is yep. Stephen, I would have, they would have taken me out and stoned me because of the name. Wow. The only way I could get the guy away from me, he's standing there in front of me and the other guy's standing in front of the camera lens like this. And they got like a hundred of their guys with the black hats. So I said, get away from my camera. And he said, no. I said, okay, here's what we're going to do. I'm a Gentile and you're a Jew. I'm going to touch you. <laughs> and he said, Lolo, Lolo means no, no in Hebrew, and he backed away. And we grabbed our camera and we got out of that situation. <laughs> but see, that just shows you those guys, they still live that way. You Gentiles, you're unclean going dogs, uncircumcised dogs. And maybe even you are circumcised, but you're not circumcised according to the tradition of Moses. And if you convert to Judaism, even if you're circumcised, they still have to cut you so you bleed, and now it's done according to Moses. So these the, the, the Gentiles are believing, and it's driving the, the Jews crazy, and they get angry. But I want to read to you what happens when he comes here. It says that it, it's a specific thing is said, and that is why I'm telling you all of those seven Berean Bible church buses came here. Not, and I'll let you figure it out, and I'll explain it to you. Okay, so after being kicked out ignominiously from Thessalonica, where we just were, he's come here. By the way, that's the same road he would have come on. So you're driving along the road of St. Paul. The, the roads we have in here today are still built on the Roman roads because the Romans were smart and knew the best routes, and we still use them today. The brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. He had to escape by night. It wasn't the only time he had to come down a wall in a basket in Damascus that night, too. It's not easy being an apostle. And when they arrived in Berea, they went into the Jewish synagogue, which he always did. Now, these Jews, this is the important verse. Now, these Jews were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Many of them believed, and but then the Jews of Thessalonica came all the way down here to get him again. So the idea is here, this, this is the verse 11, Acts 17, 11. The Jews were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. So what do we learn from examining the scriptures to see if these things were so? That scripture is the only authority, sola scriptura, the Bible alone. Even Paul came and they would only check the Bible to see if Paul was right. Okay? I'm a, that's what I used to believe when I was a Baptist. There's all oh, these churches called Berean Baptist churches. 
I'm going to tell you why they should change their name to the Church of Thessalonica Baptist Church. <laughs> <laughs> they take these verses out of context, which is what Protestants often love to do. Evangelicals, especially when they're arguing with Catholics, they'll take a verse out of the context, wrench it into something that not, has nothing to do with the biblical times, for example, it says that you are saved by faith and not by works. They turn that into a Protestant Catholic argument, right? So you do good deeds, you think you're earning your salvation by those, you're, and, and it's only by faith alone. But when Paul said by faith and not by works, he's talking about the works of the Jewish law. They used to think they were right before God and justified because they got circumcised, because they kept the Sabbath rules, because they didn't eat pork and lobster. And if they did all of those things, they'd be right with God. And Paul says, you're not made, made right with God by your works of the law. It's by faith in Christ, which is what we Catholics teach. But the Protestants in my day, and I would have done this. I'm not pointing fingers at Protestants. I'm just telling you my own past. I would have said that you Catholics are trying to earn your salvation by your works. We Baptists are saved by faith alone. But the fact is, is that you, they take that out of context. They turn that argument into a Catholic versus Protestant argument, and it's not. It's a Jewish versus Gentile argument. And the people that are quoting that verse, you have no concept of the original context of that passage, that it's referring to the Jewish, a whole Jewish economy of doing special works of the law in order to earn your salvation. Paul says, no, it's by faith. It's not a Catholic Protestant argument. It's a Jewish Gentile argument. So this they also take out of context. So let's let's take a look at this. They came to they received the word with all eagerness. What word did they receive? Was Paul reading the book of Matthew to them? Was he reading the book of Romans to them? He was reading there was no Bible yet. Even the Old Testament, whenever the New Testament refers to scriptures, guess what it's referring to? The Is it referring to First and Second Timothy? No, they weren't written yet. It was, the books of the New Testament weren't even collected into a book until the end of the fourth century. When they refer here to scriptures, he's referring to the Old Testament scriptures. And even that wasn't a collected, it was kind of ambiguous because the Sadducees only accepted Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. That's the only ones they, when Jesus argued with them, he only argued from those five books, if you go back and look at it. When he argued with the Pharisees, he argued with the whole rest of it, the prophets, which is, which in, most, which is in the Hebrew Bible today, Old Testament. And they held that, the Essenes was another group and they had a much bigger list of books. They even included the deuterocanonical books, which are called Maccabees and, and uh, Tobit and Judith and so on. So even when he says scripture, it means the writings, but that wasn't even clearly defined yet what that was. It was an ambiguous term. So Paul says, it says that they search the scriptures daily, does not teach sola scriptura. Because if, if that is the only scripture there is, then you can't add Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Can you imagine when Jesus went up into heaven, he did not turn back around and look down and say, oh, and guys, before I get into the cloud, and the last thing they saw was the bottom of his dirty feet. Don't forget to read my book, guys. <laughs> there was no book. He didn't leave them a book. He didn't even leave them a t tell them that there was going to be a book that we know of. If you would have told the Jews gathered around that in a short time there's going to be 27 books that are going to be added to the scriptures, or there's going to be 27 books added to Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy that are equally inspired by God and authoritative and infallible, they would have said you were crazy. The scriptures were the Old Testament God revealed to the prophets. Who are you to say there's going to be 27 books now that are going to be added to that? There was no scripture you know, these guys that came here earlier today, I wish they were here. <laughs> if these guys that came here today, they're all holding their Bibles with the New Testament. And when the guys tell them about they, they search the scriptures, he's going to hold. I know how they do it. They use it for a prop. Yeah. And they're going to wave that thing around. They use the scriptures. These 66 books. Catholics have 73. But that's not what this is talking about. Totally anachronistic. Reading what they have in their hand back into what Paul is saying, totally out of context. Scriptures here meant the writings of the, prof, the, the law and the prophets. They didn't even call it the Old Testament because there was no New Testament yet. When Jesus refers to it, it's always the law and the prophets. And among the Jews, it wasn't clearly defined what that was. 
So they are now going back and they're listening to Paul. What is Paul telling them? He said that they listened to Paul with eagerness and they, were, they accepted it as the word of God. What is Paul telling them? In re, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to try and read them. I'm just going to tell you. And, and when he went to, wrote to the Ephesians, he said, I am writing to you and as I've given you this new revelation that has never been revealed before. It's not in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. It's not in Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentation, Ezekiel, Daniel. I am bringing to you a revelation that has never been revealed before, and I'm telling you this. And you received it as for what it was the word of God. Now, there, the, the Thessalonians, they rejected him. They, went, they were stud arguing with the scriptures and said, we don't see what you're saying in here. So if it doesn't, if we can't see what you're saying literally in these Old Testament scriptures, then we're not going to accept you. Get out! And they chased him away. Those are the sola scriptura guys. They were only going to accept what they could see literally written in those books that they accepted as scripture. And if Paul comes with some new revelation, they were going to chase him away, treat him ignominiously, and send him away. That's why these folks that have Berean Baptist Church should really be Thessalonican Baptist Church because the Thessalonians are the ones who are the real Bible only and wouldn't even accept Paul's teaching. Now he gets here and it says that these folks received the word, logos, the word with all eagerness. Paul's new revelation Something that hadn't been revealed before. They accept it with all eagerness. And all they're saying is, let's just make sure it doesn't contradict what we already know. And as with, it says they were more noble-minded. They were more noble. See, they received the word with eagerness, examining it because they were more noble. That word noble means open-minded, willing to accept willing to listen to look it up in any i wrote a whole article on this look it up in any greek lexicon it means open-minded noble willingness to discuss and receive so they were more noble-minded not because they were sola scriptura they were more noble-minded because they received paul with gentleness and they listened to him yes they went back to what they had in as scripture and they'd have seen if it corresponded but they received his new revelation so they weren't sola scripture because they're accepting new revelation as the word of god that is not part of their original scriptures see what i mean so who's the sola scriptura guys it's the Thessalonians who ignominiously treated Paul, slapped him down, chased him out of town. They're the ones that are sola scriptura. The, no, the noble Bereans were Catholics. They were willing to accept that it's not in the book alone. When Jesus went up into heaven, he didn't say, don't forget to read my book. He didn't leave a book. Nobody even dreamed there would be a book. Not until 400 years later was it collected. What did Jesus leave behind when he went to heaven? Twelve men. It wasn't even a church. He said, I will build my church. This is the beginning. Then he left twelve men, one carrying the keys. They went out and began to teach and preach. And like Paul, he said he became one of those apostles. And he said to the Thessalonians, those who believed him, he later wrote him two letters. And in one of them, he said, hold fast to the traditions that I left you. Not hold fast to the scriptures that I left you. Hold fast to the tradition that I left you, whether it was in writing or by word of mouth. And later, he says to one of the other churches, do as you see me do. In other words, his life was also a tradition, something that was from God. He said, follow me, do what I do, and you'll be doing the right thing. So... The disciple, when, when Jesus went up, he left 12 men, one of them carrying the keys. They went out and taught and practiced. And that became the sacred tradition called the apostolic tradition. And over time, some of their writings were written down and they were later canonized as being inspired infallible word of God. Who determined that? There's how, how did you know? Some of them weren't even written by apostles. Nobody knows who wrote Hebrew. James and Jude were written by, by others. They weren't written by any apostle. Matt, um, Mark and Luke weren't apostles. So 
this whole collection of, in fact, this is a listen to this. Paul wrote half the books in the New Testament. He wasn't one of the original ones that saw Jesus grow up. The longest book in the New Testament is the Gospel of Luke. The second longest book in the Bible is the book of Acts, both written by Luke, not an apostle. Who's the one that determines which books belong in that New Testament, which are equal to the books of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy? Who makes that decision? Is it up to you? Is it just fall from heaven? <laughs> oh, that's cool. There it is. 27 books. <laughs> it was the church that determined that. It was given to the church because the church had the authority to bind and to loose, which was legislative terms at that time. The church was never going to be a loosey-goosey uh, brotherhood of people who love Jesus. And, hey, you love Jesus? Me too. Let's get together on Sunday morning and read the Bible and pray together, you know? That's kind of the mentality of the evangelicals because there is no physical Catholic church, a visible organization to belong to, which all Christians believed for the first 1,500 years until the Protestant devolution. <laughs> Sorry to say that. I was one. I can say it. You guys feel a little arrogant to say it if you're born Catholic, but I wasn't. <laughs> Do you know that in the upper room there was how many? Very good. Very few know the 120 in the upper room. And it says in the book of Acts, it doesn't say there were 120 people in the upper room. It says there were about 120 names. That would be like if I wrote home and said, hey, I had 130 names on my pilgrimage. That's very strange. If you read it in the English Bible, it says 120 people. But if you look at the Greek underlying it, it says names. Why names? Almost looks like he's talking about a list of names. Like when Janet checks you off at the airport. We have 130 names, we're all here. I look back in Jewish tradition and history. If you wanted to break away from the big city like Jerusalem and go out and start your own community with your own Sanhedrin courts and your own legislation, your own judicial, you needed to have a minimum of 120 people on a list before you could leave and go out and start your own community. What's happening in the upper room? The word a church in Greek is called ecclesia. It means the called out ones. What are they called out for? To have their own new community called the church with their own courts, their own legislatures. It is a civic government. The church was established as a civic government since the day of Pentecost. And to think it's all that there's no church has authority over me. If I don't like my Methodist pastor, I can go to my Lutheran pastor. I go to a new church. That's what my dad did. Every two years we hopped from one church to another. But the church was to be one, and it was to have one prime minister who carried the keys. And it was going to be a civic government with courts and rules. And you know that because in Matthew 18, Jesus said, if your brother sins against you, take it to the church. And if he church, they don't listen to the church, then cast them out as a tax collector and a sinner. What does he mean, the church? If you're a Baptist and I'm a, Catholic, and I'm a Lutheran and we have a problem with each other, which church do we take it to? We, where is the church that you and I can go to? I don't, your church has no authority over me. My, my church has no authority over you. In fact, my church has no authority over me. I can leave and go to another one. What it means is that the church is supposed to be worldwide and no matter who you are or where you are and you have a problem with sin, you could take it to the church because it's an organization with a judicial legislative and it has an address. What church in all the world do you think can even come close to being that? <laughs> It's the Catholic Church, and it's been here for 2,000 years. Yes, they examined the scriptures daily because they wanted to see if Paul's new revelation, which ended up being the books of Ephesians, Galatians, part of it. But these knew they were willing to accept Paul and his new revelation, and they didn't reject him because of sola scripture about the Old Testament scriptures that they had. That's why I'm a Catholic. Took me four, took me four years. <laughs> So, does that make sense? Yeah. All right. I love all of you Bereans. <laughs> Welcome to Berea.